Welcome everyone to this webinar as part of the Jean Monnet Chair series in Europe and the World. My name is Kaya Schilde. I'm a professor at the Party School of Global Studies and I am the director of the Center for the Study of Europe and Jean Monnet Chair uh, of this series over the next few years where we discuss uh, the role of the EU and Europe and the world uh, in multiple different dimensions. And so today I'm excited to welcome you to a talk by Professor Marina Henke. Uh, she is the uh, a Professor of International Relations at the Hertie School in Berlin, Germany. She's also the Director of the Hertie Center for International Security. She is an expert on many different topics in this domain. Some of my students are in the room and you will recall in, in my European, North Atlantic and European Security Seminar that we've read an article by Dr. Henke um, on um, payments, uh, allied payments, um, and looking at how there are some material incentives for allied cooperation in addition to some of the incentives people discuss. But for everyone else and beyond that article, she's an expert on military interventions, mm -hmm. peacekeeping, nuclear security, and European security and defense. And today she's actually going to be talking about something, an ongoing project right now that's related exactly to the conversation we're having on these webinars which is how Europe can thrive or how can Europe thrive in world politics. So also just as a quick reminder, this is a webinar. And so I encourage, and we will be taking questions and I'll be moderating them, but please do put the questions for Dr. Henke in the Q and A rather than the chat function. Um, and so I will organize those and, and ask them of her when she's done with her talk. Great, welcome. Okay, thanks so much, Kaya. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I will be sharing my screen with you for my presentation. So I'm doing this right now. I hope you can see it. Perfect. Okay. So, um, well, how can I, um, you know, best start? I'm in Berlin right now. I know you have been uh, listening to other speakers from Berlin. But the last, uh, you know, 10 months since uh, the invasion of Russia um, in Ukraine, the world really here in Europe, at least in a security sense, turned upside down. I lived for a very long time in the United States. I only moved back to Germany in 2020. And when I, you know, arrived there, uh, the topics of the day were climate change and, you know, of course, then very uh, quickly um, COVID and the pandemic, but security was really a backwater, I must say. A lot of Europeans and, you know, Germans in particular, um, not so much Eastern Europeans, but I would more say the West Europeans and, you know, uh, Germany uh, thought that, you know, like war, war on the European continent was really uh, something of the past. And a lot of them was, were absolutely convinced that they can, in one form or another, handle Russia. I remember conversations on February 23rd, so a day before the invasion, where very high-ranking German officials um, were telling me Russia will not invade. And of course, you know, a day later, um, everything looked um, very different. And, you know, like the big change, um, as you can see here in, in this uh, slide, was that um, the threat perception from Russia drastically increased. And as you can see here, um, compared to March 2019, um, the, the largest gap um, between those two data points actually occurred in Germany. The French even, you know, like other, they further away from, from Ukraine than, than uh, Germany. They were more prepared, so to speak, of uh, this kind of, you know, resurgent Russia. And the Swedes were more prepared, the Brits were more prepared, and certainly also um, in Poland. But truth to be told, what um, I see right now happening in the EU and also in Germany is that there is a geostrategic confusion. So the system has been shocked and it has been turned upside down and there is a perception that something needs to change, but nobody really knows what to do. Um, and so, you know, um, from uh, my point of view, this is, of course, very de detrimental, because if there is, you know, like just the confusion and chaos and just like, you know, options are being thrown, uh, thrown around, then, you know, no real grand strategic plan can actually be implemented. Um, 
And what I would like to do today uh, in my uh, half an hour or so is kind of summarize the grand strategic options that are being debated at the European level. Uh, I will kind of, you know, put them into nice packages for you to better understand uh, what the different, you know, like options are, and then go through um, the variables, so the trade-offs that are being discussed among those different options, you know, so like what type of pros and cons folks are looking at when they think through these different options. Um, and then I will conclude, um, you know, where I think that the current discussion is uh, is leading toward and, you know, how it, of course, affects Europe and also uh, the transatlantic um, alliance. So um, if you had to summarize uh, the three options that Europe has, um, realistic options, they're actually, you know, like you have um, those that I put here on the slide. Of course, there are some other options, but I feel that they're very unrealistic. So for example, a, you know, an alliance between uh, uh, Europe and Russia or Europe and China, I think that's you know, kind of too out of the ordinary. You don't really see any dynamics or forces pulling into this direction. So that's why I think it makes a lot of sense to focus on those three. I call the first one a transatlantic renewal. The second one is EU strategic autonomy. You maybe have heard this term before. And the third one is, um, you know, my term here in neutrality, because it basically like, you know, uh, is very similar to what, um, you know, in the past we have seen as like a quasi or, you know, like um, definitive neutral stance of countries or blocks. Uh, so this is not something new that has happened in the past before. And, you know, there's also a discussion around this option in Europe. So let's start with the transatlantic renewal. What would this actually um, entail? And why is it called renewal and not just the transatlantic relationship? Well, here, the basic building block of this is that Europe, you know, needs the United States. And now, of course, more than ever before, at least since the end of the Cold War, because Russia has shown that it is, um, again, uh, aggressive or revisionist, as um, you know, as some, uh, folks would say. But then there is a realization in Europe now that American support for Europe is no longer automatic. Uh, some you know, would argue that it was quasi-automatic during the Cold War, because the Americans had such an interest in preserving a peaceful and also anti-communist Western Europe. Uh, so, you know, it would help Europe no matter what, but this automaticity now no longer exists because, and you know, you guys in Boston know this uh, much better than many Europeans. And the big picture of things, America has shifted its focus and the real rival of um, foreseeable future and the real peer competitor is actually China uh, and that you know folks very often summarize as the pivot to Asia and of course away from the Atlantic. So you know under this um, larger dynamic uh, Europeans realize that they you know have to in one form or another then engage in a quid pro quo with the United States. Uh, so if they want to rely on US protection uh, they also need to give America something in return, and that is to curtail um, Europe's exposure to China uh, and help de facto the United States with its policy and, you know, um, plans in the um, Pacific. Yeah? So basically it needs to firmly side with the United States on the big China question, which, which we will see in a second is currently not the case, in particular when it comes to the economic exposure of Europe vis-a-vis -vis China. But let me first focus on like how would this look, um, you know, like in more detail. So there's always a lot of talk, uh, you know, how do um, European um, militaries, how they need to transform. Um, of course, there was a lot of uh, criticism of uh, Europe that it's spending enough and in particular the German military. So under, you know, like this kind of umbrella uh, posture of transatlantic renewal, um, the idea is that Europe would need to have a global reach. Uh, it would need to be very much interoperable with the United States. And, you know, under these circumstances, the US and Europe can deter Russia together. 
But then, you know, there are kind of two different options. Uh, so option A would say um, there will actually be a division of labor between Europe and the United States. So Europe will be in the lead of its larger neighborhood. Uh, so that, of course, includes Russia, but also in the Middle East and Africa. Uh, so the United States would then shift what, you know, to a certain degree has already um, started to uh, shift its resources from the Middle East more to the Indo-Pacific, and Europe would take on a larger role also in the Middle East, and that includes, um, you know, for example, Syria, Iraq, but also Africa, and arguably also um, Afghanistan. That is option A, so a division of labor, two pillars, one is the European pillar and one is the American pillar, but then there is coordination, of course, and what is very important, there is still combined strategic deterrence, meaning, you know, the United States provides the nuclear umbrella over Europe. Uh, so you, uh, Europe would be um, still um, very much part and parcel of a nuclear deterrence shield provided by the United States. Or one could imagine, uh, that's also being debated, how this could look like um, a complete aggregation of forces. So that means that Europe actually takes on a role in the Indo-Pacific theater. That means uh, European forces, uh, for the most part, naval forces, but one could also think of, you know, like cyber forces and, um, and other um, types of capabilities are then um, also operating in the um, Indo-Pacific uh, um, ocean and you know like basically in a much more direct role um, than under um, this first option and um, no matter you know like whether this is option a or num number uh, option b for uh, europe it's pretty clear uh, that um, europe would be uh, following it will be to a certain degree the junior partner uh, as it was during the cold war that the big strategic decisions would be coming out of the United States and Europe would be um, following. Uh, so, you know, some countries uh, laud this uh, structure, you know, they say this is this is good uh, because Europe actually cannot, or does not have the capability to think strategically and implement those plans. Others, of course, they criticize this and say, um, Europe will always play second fiddle and that's not something um, that is laudable. How would this then, you know, like translate into the institutional structures that some of you might be familiar with? Um, so here, you know, uh, arguably NATO would be strengthened. Uh, it would be the key institution of this kind of like, you know, renewed security apparatus. The EU would probably not uh, vanish, uh, but it will not develop any independent um, capabilities. Uh, so like there will not be an EU army um, to speak of. Uh, but one could, for example, imagine that under the umbrella of the European security and defense policy and this European pillar in NATO, so like this division of labor kind of idea could be organized. Uh, uh, but it would not be um, autonomous, uh, but, you know, uh, still it, it could be organized and one could, could use, you know, what has been established in an EU format. But of course, one, you know, like all the non-EU countries would also be part and parcel of this European pillar. And first and foremost, this is um, Great Britain. Um, geographically, you know, this would uh, look as follows. So Russia, it's um, US-EU combined deterrence. Um, um, but then, you know, in the Asia Pacific, um, potentially a division of labor, so that actually European forces will not go there, but a focus of European forces on Russia and the larger European neighborhood. Um, and, you know, like very clear responsibility of Europe when it comes especially um, uh, to the Middle East and, you know, and North Africa, where, you know, as most of you know, until very recently, um, there was a very large um, United States uh, presence. So, what are the trade-offs? What are the variables that folks um, look at when they try to judge uh, this option? Um, on the upside, you know, folks would say uh, transatlantic unity would be almost unbeatable in the economic realm. Uh, many of you know how strong probably um, the transatlantic economy is. Um, and it just comes to GDP overall, uh, you know, it's, uh, it would be the largest and the strongest block, uh, much stronger um, than, than China and, you know, like um, other emerging powers. And so it could set a lot of um, rules and, and regulations in the trade and in the economic sphere. And also when it comes to history, values, um, 
norms, the institutions that already exist, um, all of that could be, you know, like revitalized, revamped. Uh, you know, some folks argue that the current congressional elections in the United States were influenced by um, a very strong pro-democracy narrative. Uh, and so here, one of the glues of the transatlantic community could also be um, fighting for um, democracy and you know, common values that clearly exist on both sides of the Atlantic. So that could also provide strength and could provide you know, like soft power and a very good um, and strong and power powerful narrative. And um, as I mentioned before, you know, like a lot of European countries say um, that quote unquote, outsourcing European security um, actually provides certain political advantages. And here, you know, like I don't um, mean the old model of outsourcing, which, you know, some would call also partial free riding, uh, that Europeans were not fully um, paying up their share in the transatlantic alliance. Here, it's more of a kind of a strategic or the, like the decision making outsourcing. Um, because the United States in NATO is a primus inter pares, right? So it is much more powerful in military terms, but also in economic terms than any European country. And so it has a lot to say. And when you just look at the EU countries, particularly, um, you know, in the security and defense realm, there's a lot of bickering uh, because, you know, like a lot of them are more or less the same size. Germany is the largest, yeah, but it's very weak when it comes to secure and defense issues. And so, you know, among those kind of similar sized countries, it's sometimes you know much harder to find a consensus. And here, you know, there would be big United States basically, you know, more or less determining the big directions. And then the smaller European countries could kind of follow that lead. And for a lot of European countries, you know, not for others, but for some, and um, this is actually an advantage because it creates cohesion. Uh, and you know, like they would refer to the Cold War when this model actually worked quite well. So what are kind of the negative sides? Uh, well, the big, big negative side, uh, which is huge for Europe, and you know, I hope you really understand this, is that Europe, under this um, scenario, under this grand strategic posture, needs to reduce its exposure hard, uh, because, so as you can see here, um, the, uh, right now EU exports more from China than from the United States. Uh, so there's a huge exposure when it just comes to the sheer volume of um, uh, Chinese imports to the EU. But then the EU is also very important when it comes to exports, to EU exports. Uh, so overall, the EU still exports more to the United States than to China. Uh, but when you add up all those figures, uh, you know, like, Every year, uh, that is, you know, um, kind of, uh, it's it's a minimal difference between whether China or the United States is more important in trade terms um, to the EU. Uh, for some countries, this decision is even harder, and you know, like the key country here is Germany, as you can see um, on this on the other graph. Germany is the most important trading partner um, in the EU for China. And in particular, there are certain industries which depend to almost 40, sometimes 50% on the Chinese market. And, you know, like the first um, uh, industry here, that's actually the, the car industry. And as many of you know, Germany is a huge car industry. That's um, BMW, Mercedes, um, Audi, Volkswagen. And for example, for Volkswagen, 40% of cars are sold in China. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm based in Berlin, uh, as Kaya mentioned before, and there's like, you know, like the car industry, but also other industries, for example, the heavy machinery industry and, and also the chemical industry is now positioning itself um, in a very anti-transatlantic um, renewal or like anti-American uh, position. Uh, and a lot of this is driven by its dependence on China because they know um, that under this uh, grand strategic posture, probably their trade relations with China will not be tenable. Uh, and so they are against it and they look for alternative options. What is playing in favor of it is, however, is Ukraine. Uh, and there is a sense that, you know, like Ukraine is only still standing uh, because of the United States uh, and across the board, across all European countries, you do see 
a uh, kind of, you know, a renewed belief uh, in um, NATO um, and, you know, like the just public perception and that NATO is incredibly important. Uh, uh, there is, of course, you know, also this kind of um, uh, fear in Europe. Um, can you put all, you know, quote unquote, European eggs in the US basket? Because the memories of Trump and, uh, you know, the, your skepticism of uh, Europe are still very much um, alive and, and present. And of course, you know, all sorts of like other um, ideas coming out of the United States um, that uh, NATO should be abandoned. And, you know, also like I think the United States should turn inward and should not help Europe um, and, and so forth, right? So the discourse of, of kind of a new isolationist or uh, restrained type of uh, grand strategic thinking, and that is quite active in the United States, of course, has also arrived in, in Europe. And it's it's very much, you know, like also on people's minds here. And so that is a big question mark, you know, like even if we do all these things, you know, like we reduce our exposure to China and we're building up our military, and we will then still at one point, you know, reach um, such a scenario that the United States is pulling out um, because of some kind of domestic um, development. And that, you know, scares a lot of Europeans. And those Europeans that are scared um, of, uh, of that scenario uh, or that are very attached in particular to China, um, they are big fans of, you know, um, what is often termed EU strategic autonomy. And what you need to know is at the EU level, uh, the term EU strategic autonomy is very confused. Uh, there is no official definition. So I will provide you with a um, definition that I think is most suitable. And, you know, it's basically it's a conviction that Europe cannot and should not depend on any other entity to deal with its strategic challenges. And, you know, um, who is, you know, de facto the one entity that Europe in strategic terms, in security terms is dependent on, that's the United States. Uh, so, um, of course, one can then think, you know, like, uh, total autonomy, partial autonomy, but de facto, the idea behind EU strategic autonomy is that Europe becomes politically, operationally, but also military, industrially uh, autonomous of the United States. Uh, that's de facto the quintessential idea if you really take EU strategic autonomy seriously. And then, um, you know, a serious consideration of EU strategic autonomy also looks at at both at power projection, uh, so at you know EU actions outside of um, Europe, uh, and you know territorial defense, so the defense of the European continent by then European forces and not NATO forces. So, what would this entail? Um, very heavy investment in European defense capabilities, and as you know, um, Kaya knows very well because that's that's her expertise. And um, there needs to be a lot of uh, joining hands and harmonization of the European defense industrial base. Um, a lot of these capabilities probably could be produced in one form or another in Europe. Uh, it's, it's debatable whether, you know, European companies are uh, up to, you know, like really fifth generation, um, super high-tech equipment. Uh, but, in, you know, like more or less, there is still a defense industrial base that exists in Europe and it, of course, needs to be massively revitalized. And, you know, um, and one of the options how you can do that is if you, you know, like harmonize it um, and, and then, you know, like really um, get it going. Um, another private development of, of this idea is that Europe develops then a, some form of a Euro deterrent force that is like a nuclear deterrent that is somehow an EU based. Most of the ideas that are circulating um, is uh, they are based on French nuclear forces. Um, and then, you know, it's very vague and very unclear, but some kind of EU mechanism, but that would be, you know, like um, uh, in one form or another. Um, focused on, on, on France. So no actual nuclear weapons that are in the hands of, of EU officials in Brussels, so to speak. So um, what does this mean institutionally? Um, so here you, you absolutely require a deeper defense integration. So it's impossible to have such a strategic posture um, at, you know, like at 27, uh, so at unanimity, um, and every single country can veto that. Um, so you need to have either some form of um, EU Security Council, that's like one option that is debated, somewhat similar to the UN Security Council that some of you might be familiar with, but you know, like I can go into details in the Q&A, 
or you have um, just like a you know a, a smaller uh, group of countries that is you know four or five big EU member states that kind of like go ahead um, and uh, you know and 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 others are less um, active in these kind of constellations, uh, and you know and then they have um, only a, a veto. But anyway, like institutionally, it requires um, more integration, uh, which of course is also very problematic. Um, I think under the scenario, NATO will be weakened or even totally um, abandoned, uh, just because if you're really serious about EU strategic autonomy, uh, then it doesn't make any sense to also invest um, into a kind of a transatlantic um, force, uh, because this is already incredibly expensive and incredibly complex. And, you know, for example, from a German perspective, and if you really want to develop this, you know, then you, you have to invest billions and billions of euros into, for example, a European fifth generation fighter jet. And then it doesn't really make sense to keep up, you know, like buy an F-35 and from the United States. And I, like some people say you can have it both. You can be strategically autonomous and have the transatlantic um, alliance working at the same time. Um, I do not think so. Uh, I think this is, uh, you basically try to develop, you know, both, you try to be a, a ballerina and a, a violinist at the same time. Most of you know, you know, like that's just at a really high level of perfection, that's impossible. Uh, uh, and at one uh, point, you need to decide what you really want. Otherwise, you know, like if one pillar falls away, um, you're left with, with very little. Mm -hmm. So how would this look like when it comes to geographic applications? Here, you know, of course, Europe then can decide what it does with Russia. Uh, it can independently contain Russia. Uh, it can also try to roll it back to have an aggressive posture vis-a-vis -vis Russia. But it can also think of like some kind of great power arrangement. You know, that's exactly the definition of autonomy. You know, like there are all sorts of arrangements. And some folks would even say that that's the most likely, uh, some kind of, you know, like um, hold peace between um, the EU and Russia. The same also applies to the Asia Pacific, and there can be an independent European strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, and that's why so many, in particular German, you know, industry officials are so much in favor of strategic autonomy, because you know, like such an posture would entail that they can keep on trading with China, right? Um, it would not require for them for, to pull out of China, which would probably be the requirement under the transatlantic renewal. And the same also applies to the neighborhood, you know, so there can be all sorts of uh, ways to deal with terrorist threats, but also in general, um, just instability in, in Europe's neighborhood in the Middle East and North Africa and so on, can be diplomatically handled with military means um, uh, and so on. What are here the big pluses? Well, Europe can indeed maximize its own interests. It can do whatever it wants. Um, I mentioned China, but by the way, Iran is also one of these big topics where, you know, like the threat perceptions in Europe and in the United States largely diverge. You know, like the large majority of, of Europeans do not perceive a threat coming out of Iran. And, you know, as you know, this is very different in the United States. Uh, so in all of these different categories where there are real um, differences in threat perceptions, Europe can do what it wants, uh, and it doesn't have to fall in line. Under the transatlantic renewal, it would be different uh, in one form or another. Europe then has to fall in line and follow a U.S. lead. What are here um, the big negatives? Potentially, um, it's very expensive, slash maybe even, you know, like not really uh, possible. Um, and that's only at the de defense industrial um, uh, front. I, for me, you know, like I'm less of a skeptic when it comes to the, the military capabilities. I think if there's a lot of investment, um, Europe can probably pull this off in one form or another. I'm very skeptical when it comes to further political integration, because, you know, uh, although uh, leaving the EU ever since Brexit happened, it has become very unpopular, uh, but I really don't see right now any uh, probability that France or even Germany for that matter is willing to give up sovereignty over these security questions to some kind of higher entity, some kind of rotating security council mechanism, uh, whatever form this takes. Um, and uh, I, you know, like I also look at Italy, I also look at Scandinavia, you know, like such a political integration, I think is, is very, very hard to achieve, but I cannot, you know, like see actual strategic autonomy happen if you do not have and the political institution uh, to do so. Uh, with the unanimity rules, I really see uh, 
um, you know, like uh, this being a pipe dream. Um, and then, you know, we just like see that overall there is, you know, some support uh, for this idea of European strategic autonomy. But then there's also a lot of contestation. And by the way, this contestation has only grown since Ukraine. Uh, so now this is data from before the war, uh, where you see that for some countries it's extremely important. And here you have Germany, you have France, you have Italy, Greece. And, but you know, for others, and by the way, Romania is one of the countries that shifted now. It's just like the, the real data um, that exactly asks the same question hasn't, hasn't been published yet. Um, but for Romania, but now of course for Poland, for Lithuania, Latvia, Estonia, but also Finland and Sweden. Uh, so they have all grown much more skeptical of EU strategic autonomy because they feel, you know, like they look at what the EU can do and did in the Ukraine crisis, and they concluded that it's not enough uh, and that the United States needs to be on board if any kind of deterrent uh, mechanism is um, to uh, is work um, in, in the Russian, uh, in the Russian um, uh, context. So actually we see a very interesting um, alliance forming between Scandinavian countries, Eastern European countries, and then Southeastern European countries. So that's um, Romania and Bulgaria in particular. Uh, who now say, you know, like we actually need to fully go back to NATO and, you know, more or less abandon um, the EU. Uh, but, you know, Germany is still the one country that uh, is somewhat holding on uh, to this idea that EU strategic autonomy is uh, feasible. Uh, so here you see data that's also from um, 2020. Um, but, you know, living in, in Berlin, I can confirm that these, these ideas are still very much alive. Uh, as you can see here, you know, there's this idea that, you know, like 45% uh, say Germany and Europe should continue to rely on the relationship with the United States. But, you know, like you have a slight majority saying, well, you know, there should also be um, a push away um, from the United States and they should become more independent. Um, Germans, but also French um, and people in Brussels at the EU, so at EU institutions also love the term um, equidistance. Um, and, and, you know, like it's actually a term that was born um, much, uh, you know, um, long ago, not just now in the context when like strategic autonomy was um, developed. Um, it dates from the 1970s. And here you can see some polling data from the Cold War. Uh, and it uh, shows that already then, for very interesting reasons, Germans had um, this the wish um, to be equidistant between the United States and the Soviet Union back then. Uh, and as you can see here, you know, like it actually grew over the years. Uh, it kind of was born during Vietnam, you know, but Germans kind of turned away from the United States, some of them at least. Uh, and then, you know, like during the in the 1980s, um, it grew stronger and stronger, um, and you know, like uh, ending up, you know, like in the almost at, at 50 percent. Uh, so the idea of, uh, and you know, like I would love to discuss this with you in the Q and A, um, where this kind of like um, attitude comes from. But the idea of equidistance between two poles is something that you know, like especially uh, Germans, but also others in Europe, are quite fond of. So what's the third strategic options? I call it neutrality um, because de facto um, that's what it what it is. Although you know, like a lot of folks would call it um, differently. So the key um, assumption here is that Europe prioritizes non-military means that can be you know like called civilian power, normative power, economic power, smart power, and you name it. Um, but um, it's you know like all not related to military force. And um, here, you know, like also uh, Europe might transcend some security threats by taking a neutral position. That's already happened plenty of times um, in the past, uh, in the history. Um, so, you know, for example, Argentina was neutral during the Second World War, of course, the famous Switzerland example, but even during the Cold War, you had countries such as Ireland and Finland and Austria uh, being, um, you know, at least uh, on paper, uh, neutral. And, um, but, you know, why isn't it um, kind of a totally demilitarized neutrality? Because there is a realization when this option is being discussed and um, that Europe still needs to have like minimal military 
and capabilities. So very often, especially in, in a German context, they use Switzerland as an example. Switzerland does have a military. It is capable, at least, you know, like that's what they say. It is capable of um, defending itself, uh, but that's the only purpose of the military. Uh, so it would be a, a very defensive posture and um, with, you know, like a key focus, or actually the key focus to deter Russia. And here, what is what, what is very important to deter Russia from an invasion of Western Europe. Uh, so the problem of this is actually that this would de facto um, entail that Europe needs to abandon the Baltics. Why? Um, that has a lot to do with military strategy, uh, but, uh, you know, like the Baltics are very small countries. Um, one can imagine that, you know, like uh, in a surprise attack, um, Russia can take them. And since they're much, much smaller than Ukraine, um, Russia could probably take them in a day or two or, you know, max three. Um, and so like for a counter offensive um, that would work. Um, and so, you know, like to build up the forces to then take back the Baltics, uh, um, this posture is not able. Uh, so it would be able to kind of uh, build a defensive wall in Poland uh, and kind of protect that because like that cannot be taken by a, a, a surprise attack. It's much, much larger. And uh, so you have strategic depth in Poland that you do not have in the Baltic states. You also have the strategic depth in Finland. Uh, but, you know, so de facto, if you want to take this neutrality posture um, and Russia attacks the Baltics, they're probably gone. Uh, and Europe would not have the offensive capabilities to, to take um, take back the Baltic states, which, of course, raises a lot of normative political, um, you know, uh, strategic questions. Uh, but in this kind of scenario, uh, Europe does not need to massively invest in the military. It also technically you know like at least this is what the discussion and um, you know like always like focuses on um also looking at what happens in ukraine uh, that you know like it can um, focus on um, defensive military means not offensive military means uh, russia will be in the offensive and it's also not that good at the offensive as we can see in ukraine although you know like that might all, all shift and going forward you know because we're looking here at the next like 15 20 years um, but in the, the long term, you know, like what the, the basic assumptions of this um, strategic posture is that military spending is much less than under the strategic um, autonomy um, framework. Um, and, you know, like but also a European nuclear deterrence is part and parcel of this um, force structure. Here, um, you know, my prediction is also that the transatlantic bond and NATO would probably also weaken because I don't think in the United States they would be very happy about this neutrality posture. Uh, again, you know, like that would allow Europe to kind of, you know, um, get a, a free ticket out of the entire China conflict. And I think a lot of voices in, in Washington would not be happy about it. Uh, I could also imagine that there's a lot of criticism. Again, you know, Europe um, free riding, not really taken up. Um, it's a share of, you know, like, uh, upholding the liberal board order, uh, because again, this is a very kind of um, hedgehog type of position, a very self-centered, uh, navel-gazing uh, European position. So I think, you know, like at the moment there's um, a president in power in the United States who is not very Europhile, you know, they would probably say like, well, that's it then, you know, like if you just take care of yourself and you don't look beyond Europe, then, you know, like there's nothing for us um, to do. Uh, it would also probably require further integration in the EU security and defense um, level. Uh, but, you know, um, since the, the tasks of this very defensive postures are much less complex than in it, if you have, you know, um, a much more ambitious policy under um, uh, strategic autonomy, one could imagine that, you know, maybe um, the institutional arrangements that are necessary under this neutrality framework are a little bit easier to establish than under the EU strategic autonomy framework. How would this geographically look like? And um, here again, Europe um, would probably first try to resolve any tensions with Russia by a diplomatic and institutional arrangements. Uh, one could, you know, like kind of think of, um, you know, uh, Europe de facto helps Russia with, uh, you know, oil and gas um, development and so forth. It's like so, there's a techno uh, technological um, exchange and so forth, and like you know, with the hope that then um, Russia, um, you know. Like, uh, 
spares Europe of, of any misery. Um, and, you know, like there is a certain deterrence function by Europe having this defensive um, capability, also um, a nuclear deterrent. Um, but of course, you know, all this is, is kind of a gamble. Uh, it's a gamble that Russia accepts this neutrality arrangement and, you know, like doesn't touch um, uh, Europe and especially it doesn't touch the Baltics, but it also might go uh, awry. And, um, you know, under the most likely scenario under this posture is that Europe would stay out of the Asia Pacific and, you know, also handles a lot of the security threats um, in Europe's neighborhood in the Middle East via institutional arrangements, kind of like these, you know, soft power, normative power, smart power um, type of strategies. So what are, um, you know, the trade-offs here? Um, it appears that quite some um, citizens in EU countries prefer neutrality. And again, I'm looking here in particular at uh, Germany, um, but also in countries such as um, Austria, there's also in Italy, you know, there is a, an inclination uh, to support this, this posture. Uh, and the idea is, you know, like what I always hear in Berlin is like, you know, we want to just get along with everybody. We want to be a bridge building country. Um, but, you know, like if you look a little bit closer on the assumptions uh, that Europe's, European or like Germans are making when they say we want to get along with everybody, we want to be a bridge building countries, but we don't want to create any enemies. That's de facto it's that, you know, probably they wouldn't call themselves neutral because they, of course, know that they're still part of, of NATO. But de facto, the, the wishful thinking that they have is you know that they are um, a neutral uh, country, and one could also say that um, it's maybe the lowest common denominators among European governments if they had to take um, a decision, uh, which is you know like we're protecting ourselves but nobody else because when it comes to what else are we doing, uh, uh, you know then very quickly um, positions diverge. But of course, the big trade-offs are um, deterrence might not work and Europe might be then very vulnerable. Uh, we have seen that Russia um, can be very aggressive. Uh, so, you know, like if it attacks the Baltic states, uh, then what, um, you know, can we really stomach that? And of course, you know, like one could also argue that under this neutrality framework, Europe forgoes a lot of international um, influence. So just some data that kind of like shows that, you know, there is, um, interest in this position. Um, this is data from 2020 um, that says, you know, like that's again, Germany, yeah, where you have 82% of Germans saying in this kind of new Cold War, how it was phrased here, how should German positioning itself? Uh, 82 say it should be neutral. Mm -hmm. And also here, you know, like question of should Germany get more involved in international crisis, actually larger share of the participants said, you know, we should be restrained, we should not be involved, um, or like less involved than before. Uh, so I think kind of just two data points that show that at least in the largest country in the European Union, this idea of neutrality um, is, is quite prevalent and, and quite powerful. So let me conclude and then I'm really looking forward to your, to your comments um, and questions. Maybe you've heard the term before, um, Zeitenwende, uh, that's, uh, you know, it's been thrown around everywhere um, in Germany, and now it has already taken on, you know, like a life um, at the EU level. And it basically um, means a watershed movement, uh, that the world will never be the same um, as it was prior to February 24th, when the Russian invasion of Ukraine occurred. And the Zeitenwende, I think, is real. Uh, it has really arrived in Europe. Uh, Europeans across the board, whether this is Portugal or Finland, uh, whether this is Ireland um, or uh, Romania, uh, realize that, you know, like this, the time for um, uh, will not come back. But now what I see uh, in my travels and in like all sorts of meetings that I attend is there's an absolute confusion. Uh, there is a real lack of a geostrategic direction uh, or, or even of a geostrategic vision. Uh, and instead, you know, like these three postures are being debated uh, very often, you know, like they don't carry those names that I've given them. Uh, but in essence, it is, you know, like what, what lies behind the, the conversations. Uh, and um, since there is such a lack of geostrategic direction, um, this of course impedes political coherence. 
um, any uh, efficiency of the resource management and also to a certain degree democratic accountability. Uh, and I, uh, you know, Germany, but actually many European countries there has been a pretty significant increase in defense spending or plans at least to, to increase defense spending. There's also a kind of a new dynamism. Uh, but uh, if you don't know actually where you're going and what you would like to do with the money, uh, then of course, uh, a lot of the money, a lot of this energy gets wasted on all sorts of ad hoc projects that don't form a coherent whole. Um, what Europe tries to do right now is um, build a house, but without a blue, um, um, without any plans. Um, so, you know, like they're buying a, a kitchen here and a uh, fireplace there and some windows over there but you know like they don't actually know how this entire house looks like and that's extremely um, problematic uh, and um and you know like sadly there is no leadership in europe that could pull all these forces together and say like we have to focus now because otherwise like this all of this doesn't make any sense uh, there is no leadership it doesn't come from uh, germany it doesn't come from france the EU leaders uh, in the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, um, is not, uh, or, you know, like the high representative of foreign affairs, Borrell, is not strong enough, pow powerful enough to actually be, you know, like a, a leader in this discussion. And so, you know, like, you're, it's kind of like all over the place. And of course, this also causes problems for NATO and the future of the transatlantic alliance. Because I think at least under Biden, there is a real interest in this renewal of the transatlantic um, uh, alliance. Uh, but, you know, like there's also this, you know, like they feel that Europe is divided, uh, especially in like big countries such as France and Germany, but also um, increasingly Italy. And there is a, a very often a lukewarm reception. And, you know, I think um, like the United States will only tolerate that um, for, for such a, you know, like uh, not for, for eternity, but only for, for quite um, a while. So I uh, will stop here. Um, and I hope I hope I have provided some food for thought. And uh, as I said before, I'm really looking forward to your, to your questions. I will stop the, um, sh the screen sharing now and turn to you. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thank you so much. This was incredibly thought provoking and, uh, and very differently framed from some other things I've heard lately. So I am full of questions, but um, I'm going to mix my questions in with student questions, and there's already one from my class, and that's from Arisha, and she asked, out of all the grand strategic postures that you've presented here, um, which one can you assess a little bit of probability thinking of which one you think is most likely to happen and why? A little bit of scenario, like if this, then that, or, or probabilistic, or, or however you really see it in terms of the relative weight. Hmm. So I think outside forces will actually make this determination, which to a certain degree is quite quite sad uh, because I'm always like somebody, I say like, you have to take your destiny in your own hands. Um, but here it's either, you know, it is that uh, Russia will be so aggressive uh, and will really use in one form or another, it could be a nuclear weapon or um, some other, uh, you know, like massive cyber attack on Europe that Europeans get really scared and then realize that neutrality is just not an option. Uh, because they're too vulnerable um, or can be blackmailed because if you really look at all the instances of quote-unquote neutral countries and again you know in Europe like there's always like the big um, Switzerland example Switzerland was neutral during the second world war wasn't beautiful but the truth is that Switzerland was de facto a Nazi uh, um, colony uh, and uh, they were being blackmailed by the Nazis all the time uh, they were uh, you know collaborating, whether this was on, you know, on, on delivering uh, Jewish uh, citizens to them or, you know, like on the, on all sorts of like other questions. So de facto, you know, they were totally under um, Nazi control. And so, you know, like it's a total illusion. Uh, so first is like, I think that the big uh, variable here is, is Russia. Um, and then also, you know, like the, this idea of strategic autonomy, uh, when uh, there's a lot of talk about we can do this and like, you know, we have the capabilities, but, uh, you know, when you really then look a little bit closer, what does Europe actually need, you know, and it starts with missile defense systems, capabilities for that, you know, like where Europe is um, very, very weak, extremely weak right now when it comes to the technology. 
But then the other big variable, of course, is also the United States. Uh, so uh, if there is a, a new president or a new administration uh, that is very hostile towards uh, Europe uh, and makes, you know, like, or actually puts into uh, action uh, kind of policies that, that make Europe very um, angry or, or, you know, skeptical of, of US support, then, you know, like we also see a, a convergence of, of Europeans then, you know, I mean, and nothing, and in, in Kai, you, you observed this also for, you know, like decades now, very little happens um, in EU um, security and defense policy. Um, and the only moments when something happens, it's actually like it's the United States doing something. That was the Iraq War in 2003, and all of a sudden you had some action. And then, you know, like the election of Trump, and all of a sudden you had, you know, all sorts of like defense funds and all sorts of initiatives being taken. Uh, so I think it's two, those two variables. Um, and if we don't really see actions on those two fronts, so Russia or the United States, then I think it will be a muddling through, uh, but nothing will actually um, come out. Uh, I can also actually picture the United States in um, 10 to 15 years, uh, come to Europe and say, um, either you're with us or you're against us. Uh, so a much more uh, direct approach in saying like, you know, like if you want to keep NATO alive, then you have to cut ties with China period. And if you're not doing it, we're out. Uh, because this, uh, you know, like Asia Pacific um, thing is is like such a critical focus for the United States uh, going forward and, you know, around Taiwan, for example. Yeah. Thank you. So I have a few student questions, but they're going into a couple of different directions. And I want to keep you, I want to ask a couple big questions first. I think I have enough time to, to do this. Um, I want to ask you, I want to stay on these strategic options. I think this was really, it, 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 it provokes a lot of questions the way you've laid it out. Not that I'm questioning you, but it has a lot of implications, secondary and tertiary implication of the way you've laid it out. And I actually wanted to push you a little bit or ask a question about the interaction between some of those scenarios. I think they're a little bit interdependent and I don't mean that as a crit critique at all, but they have, some interdependence causally in terms of how they might unfold. So the first one was kind of keeping a status quo strategically of closeness between um, a reliance on NATO deterrent, you know, a, a keeping keeping a close relate transatlantic relationship, but that that would uh, necessitate necessitate a change in the status quo towards China, correct? In terms of economic interdependence, um, but then um, the 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 neutrality um, scenario. Is um, is also the political status quo right now, as you showed. You know, eighty-two percent of Germans, especially, saying they choose that. So I kind of see a sleepwalking of the two status quos, where there is a political status quo, strategic status quo of neutrality, um, colliding with this, you know, transatlantic status quo of unity, colliding with then an actual deepening of interdependence with China on the part of, of especially Germany. Um, in our class, we've talked a little bit about Olaf Scholz's uh, trip to China. Also a few weeks ago, um, Daniela Schwarzer was here um, and she was talking very specifically at a talk at BU about um, kind of the micro foundations of uh, German pivot towards, towards China, um, specifically around energy and a reliance of on, on a, the part of um, chemical companies like um, by ASF um, on energy and in, in, a, in an acceleration of FDI towards China from Germany. So it seems like all of these scenarios are really crashing into each other in a very um, messy way. And so I'm wondering if um, this, this framing of neutrality and this desire for neutrality politically and a desire to just keep um, deepening commercial interdependence then is a causal forcing of strategic autonomy or a narrowing of European options eventually in the way that you've laid it out. It really um, challenges my thinking in terms of what would lead to strategic autonomy. And in my mind, based on what you've presented, actually German interdependence with China would force potentially a decoupling with the US and then force strategic autonomy through a pathway I hadn't thought about. Mm, yeah. So here's what's what's uh, what's kind of happening, what I, you know, from an academic perspective, of course, as a, as a researcher, what I find quite fascinating. So yes, you have the car industry and the chemical industry and some heavy machinery being extremely pro-China, but that's not all of Germany. 
right? So Germany also has telecommunication, right? So T-Mobile that you guys have everywhere in, in, in the United States is a German company. And Germany also have some, you know, not many, but some big software companies, that's SAP, right? So there is then some insurance companies and banking companies and, you know, so like the, the German economy is, is, is not extremely diverse, but it's much more diverse than just cars and, and chemicals. And what I see right now is that all these other branches and pretty, you know, like they're pretty strong, they're actually coming together as a counterweight to the pro-China camp. It has four, you know, uh, for example, T-Mobile, that's like big, you know, like uh, actor I'm, I'm in contact with a lot. Um, they are, uh, you know, their biggest competitor is Huawei. Huh? And they have huge markets in the United States. So what we will see, I think, at least in the in the midterm play out in Germany is actually a domestic fight. Uh, so I don't think that it's all of Germany being captured by these pro-China forces. I think it will be, you know, like we will see, and probably even then, you know, like it will be displayed in elections. Uh, so we will have a pro-China camp. And then also an anti-China camp, because in the anti-China camp, to build this up more a little, you have more and more, for example, the Green Party, right, based on very different other um, uh, variables, but, you know, it's like they're um, pro-human rights, uh, you know, like, um, in, in, in kind of like other um, uh, preferences that they have that brings them in the anti-China camp. So in this sense, um, I think I, I really foresee a battle inside of Germany, and it will be quite the battle. Uh, of uh, you know pro and, and anti-China forces, and I cannot predict right now the outcome of this battle. Uh, but you know, like what kind of gives me a little bit of you know hope or at least optimism is that um, the car industry is also in itself in a in a huge. I mean, in a it's it's a huge revolutionary moment actually because the old model of the you know, like injection engine uh, with car is no longer viable and they know it, you know, and then if they all of a sudden then have to compete with electric cars, all of a sudden, you know, like China is actually a competitor, not the, the huge market that it was, you know, like it's until now. Uh, so I think everything of this will be shifting. Um, but for the long run, I fully concur with you. I think that will be just um, stuck in inertia. Uh, and um, so why am I very skeptical of EU strategic autonomy? Because it would require real action. It will, would require real leadership. This leadership can only come, you know, out of de facto, you know, Germany, France, and maybe Italy or some kind of other coalition. But Germany has to be part of it. Uh, and I really don't see this, this leading role anywhere. Uh, and that's why I think strategic autonomy is really not uh, feasible right now. It will not happen. Uh, it will rather be, you know, like, tending always towards neutrality, maybe then like being pushed forward again, you know, like under certain governments towards this transatlantic alliance. And so, you know, it probably will be then in, in US hands to say like, where are you? You know, what is actually happening? Uh, but of course, in the big picture of things, unfortunately, I don't think like Europe will be a, an, an actor or a, an important pole in this new order forming. You know, that is just like too much confusion that is happening and too much indecision and too much uh, lack of, of their own like understanding of what they actually want and where they're actually going. Yeah. So I have a couple of great questions building, but um, I'm going to hang uh, on to a, um, one or two of my questions first and then we'll open it up to the questions and I'll read them to you. So I wanna push you on, you know, I, feel, I, I agree with you um, about this, but also um, your assessment about strategic autonomy is very dependent on the definition of strategic autonomy that you put forward. And I smiled, I chuckled when you said how messy it was, uh, that it's all over the place what people mean by strategic autonomy. But I like your definition, but it also um, it's also kind of a maximalist definition of strategic autonomy, that it would be a separation from the United States, both um, defense industrially, um, um, operationally, and what was the other one, financially or something like that. Politically, politically, I mean, not politically, right, right exactly. Right. Um, and so what struck me is um, that there were a couple of assumptions embedded in there. And um, you're not wrong, it just is that that prediction depends on that definition. So I wanna push you um, because there was a little bit of um, assumption that NATO does this well, 
<laughs> you know, and and you know, in my class, a big learning outcome we've gone over. The students might be sick of it by now. When we talk about NATO, at least in 20th century NATO, just how messy NATO is and how little NATO was tested in its core roles and how politically divided it always was. And so these are big things we go over. And so um, I often push people in these conversations about why do we assume NATO is good at this? Um, it is good at one thing. Well, maybe good at one thing, having a strategic deterrent, right? Um, but is it good at territorial defense? Um, we don't know. And um, so that, that assumption, if we weaken it slightly, and then we also separate out um, strategic and political from operation or political and operational from defense industrial autonomy, then that's where I see the role of an EU actually as a powerful market actor in shaping market incentives and outcomes for um, defense industrial outcomes. And so would there not be another scenario where you divide um, instead of dividing the globe in terms of division of labor, where you divide that definition of strategic autonomy up a little bit. Um, yeah. Excellent questions, of course. <laughs> and so why do people think NATO is good at this that we are talking about here, right? Because this is kind of, you know, the successor of the Cold War. NATO is back at the task that we think it is good at because it, you know, was good at it during the Cold War, at least in the sense that it, the Cold War never escalated and, you know, like de facto NATO won, right? And um, was NATO good at uh, stability operations in Afghanistan and in Libya? And, you know, what could also, uh, you know, probably in the Balkans, it was a little bit more successful. Clearly not. Uh, but now we're to a certain degree to a, this kind of decade old task where I think NATO did prove that it was pretty successful at. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, it's, it's quite remarkable. Maybe you've seen this also, but whether you're, you know, in Rome at the NATO Defense College or in Brussels, they're really pulling out you know, like the, the doctrines and, you know, the exercise schedules from, from the 80s uh, and like strategic deterrence. And, and then of course now they're trying to update it and like, because technology has changed. But um, all of that stuff that was thought, you know, like they would never use again, because this new age had dawned in the 1990s with these uh, out of area operations. Now it's kind of like no more, you know, back to uh, like the basics and, and what we're actually like, why we were created in the first place. And so I think this is why, why folks are, have this optimism. Of course, you're absolutely right. You know, like we are in a different age uh, and there's all sorts of dimensions, just cyber being one, but you know, like information um, uh, technology across the board and every single, um, military capability that you have, you know, like it's, it's a totally new world compared to the 1980s. Um, uh, but still, you know, like that's why there's this, this hope that the NATO can do that. And um, the other question of uh, political uh, and uh, operational versus defense industrial is also very interesting. But here, as you also know, you know, like for example, the Reaper drones, um, uh, they're phenomenal, really good. Uh, at least that's you know like um, what they say. But and that's the big question, you know. So uh, a lot of folks would say, if you buy American equipment, America can will have microchips um, inserted, and you know like they will be in one form or another able to control. Uh, and to what a degree that is problematic or not is, is always, you know, some folks, it's like, it's on a spectrum. Some folks is like the French, you know, like super problematic, you know, others say like, it's not so problematic. But the moment you purchase um, stuff, uh, whatever that is, uh, from missiles to drones to fighter jets, you know, the more complex, probably the more control the United States has, the more dependency crew create on spare parts, on training and so forth. But the more you, you, provide leverage to the United States, right? Because, you know, for example, Europe then wants to have its autonomous policy in Iran and they want to use this American equipment bought by Europe. Europe uh, and, and then, you know, like the Americans can in one form or another, either like on the minimum like spectrum, observe exactly what the Europeans are doing on the maximum, even stop it. Uh, and I think that's why I think it's problematic to say you, you can be politically operational uh, independent, but not defense industry, right? I think if you really want to be independent, 
you probably also need to have like these the big chunks of, of technology made in Europe. Um, and but you know, of course, this is all like a lot of Americans would say we're not controlling you, and then you know, like you have others like saying like, no, 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 like they can't. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, um, I want. I, I I'm glad I pushed you on that. Um, another fantastic answer. Thank you. Okay, so we have a couple questions now. now our conversation is bending towards the questions. Um, one um, guest and student from my class um, is asking specifically about PESCO projects um, around that are oriented towards EU strategic autonomy um, and whether this really, what, what you think, what your assessment of PESCO is, especially with regards to your second strategy of EU strategic autonomy. Where do you think this goes? How important do you think it is as a building block, especially towards operational autonomy potentially? Is there a link? Mm -hmm. So what I mentioned before, you know, Europe tries to build a house by just, you know, randomly, if I may say, purchasing parts or building up parts. And that's exactly PESCO, you know? So, you know, probably um, your student uh, knows a lot about PESCO. Uh, so, you know, some have um, underwater robotics. So de facto, like uh, an underwater drone, you know, like where a couple of countries are participating. Others are actually working on missile weapons and others are working on cyber and others working on, you know, uh, more uh, kind of like field hospitals and, and whatnot, you know. But in none of that uh, is a coherence to ask, you know, who are actually our key strategic challenges? Like who is actually our enemy? Uh, because if you have as your key enemy Russia, uh, you need a completely different set of an underwater drone than if you think your key enemy is China or Iran, or terrorism, or whatever. Uh, and that's why, you know, I think it, um, sure, we can do with that and hope that it will all fit together and make sense. Uh, but the likelihood that you have then all sorts of pieces and it doesn't fit together is very high. That's, you know, like what I, I'm very crit critical of, of the strategy development at the EU. I think the global strategy and also the strategy comp compass are complete nonsense. They're wish lists. It's kind of like we want, you know, X, Y, Z, but by never defining what actually stands between us, meaning Europe, you know, uh, uh, kind of reaching security. You know, what's our theory of security? It does not exist. Um, and uh, so, you know, as a, as a training ground, sure, you can do PESCO, uh, but we'll actually build uh, some, you know, like a coherent whole. I'm, I'm very skeptical. And that's why I'm quite skeptical also of, of, of PESCO. I appreciate your answers. I'm chuckling because um, the students have been, um, have been exposed to me yelling, uh, strategy for what <laughs> in class? Yeah. It's like the donut hole in the middle of the donut. Um, yeah. And because 10 years ago, it was about out of our area operations. Yeah. And there really hasn't been a reckoning, a real a real speaking to the camera about security for what. Um, yeah. It's just not, ha I mean, there are a lot of things in the site and Vende and the and the pivot this spring, but the but there isn't an actual reckoning about that. Um, and it's not, it's not an admission or of anything. It's just an acknowledgement of, of a changing security environment and that one is being threat responsive, I think. Um, but that is the last bit of the puzzle a little bit that I observe too as a watcher and, a, and, and, and in my interactions that frustrates me to no end. Yeah, absolutely. There's an assumption that it's Russia now, but that has recently changed quite a bit um, from before. And um, the big picture conversation isn't there yet. Yeah, yeah. And there's not even a consensus on this Russia, actually, like at least the degree of threat, you know, and I hear voices in, in, in Germany, it's kind of like, well, you know, like once this Ukraine thing is over, we can basically go to a, um, a status quo ante. Uh, and, you know, I, I look at them, it's like, what? <laughs> uh, but, you know, that's, that's also very, very widely, uh, you know, um, believed in France. Um, and, uh, you know, yeah. also in Italy. You know, and uh, I'm filled with anxiety about how that will interact with conditions this winter too. Um, mm -hmm. So we have a few fantastic questions I wanna make sure we get to. Um, mm -hmm. And that is um, a student is asking a little bit more and I endorse this too about your, your can you characterize the strategic conversations around the new European nuclear deterrent using French capabilities? What is the likelihood of this? What would this look like in practice? 
what what evidence is there for it or is it just a scenario right now or is there any political evidence or movement that you can see making mm -hmm. that more clearly? So the conversation was actually much louder during Trump than, um, than now. And it was really driven by the French. So I was in a private conversation and I, I, can, I can say this, you know, with a couple of um, strategists and analysts like me um, and uh, Macron in, uh, in uh, 20, 2019, 2019, uh, where he actually, you know, like really said that this is one of the priorities and we want to push it forward and so forth. But, you know, what I think is very, very important, it was never that the French were transferring nuclear weapons to the EU level, or that there would be some kind of, you know, council that would decide on uh, military uh, usage of the nuclear weapons. It would also always be under the total control of the French, but with some kind of consulting, um, maybe mechanism. But, you know, like decision to launch a nuclear weapon would always be the decision of the French president. And he was, he was very clear about that. What, you know, we hoped for, and this was like, a, you know, um, some skeptical voices uh, in, in Germany were always saying that the French nuclear force needs a massive modernization, and that's very expensive. Uh, and they also need a diversification if, if uh, you know, if you really want, want it to be credible and a euro deterrent force, because it's actually very, very small. And uh, and so, you know, like there are some cynical voices, as I may say, said, you know, like that French president was talking about all these topics, but, you know, all he really wanted was to get money um, out of you know EU uh, countries to, to finance these, these processes. And, and there was never a serious offer made to actually have a, for better or worse, by the way, you know, like to, have, to have Euro deterrent force, meaning that there was actually any kind of political say over what was happening. You know, it was a French project, but with some kind of very vague um, uh, buy-in, but a clear, you know, like a desire to have um, financial support in, uh, in this modernization uh, program. But Interestingly, this really um, uh, has completely uh, died down um, since uh, Ukraine. And uh, now there's a lot of talk, you know, at, at the NATO level, of course, a lot of talk um, on, you know, like what to do, strategic deterrence, what to do with the forward deployed nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, um, you know, how deterrence in this like new nuclear age would look like. But I very rarely hear any like EU plans or European plans on that, like almost never. And the truth is that France and also Germany, but in particular France, really has lost a lot of legitimacy, especially in the quote unquote kind of frontline states that are now perceived as frontline states. And that's Baltic states, but that's also Scandinavia. So, you know, like they really became very active with their entry into NATO, Finland and Sweden. And then also interestingly, Bulgaria and Romania, you know, like they do not trust the French on that question uh, because the French were also, by the way, one of the countries that believed until the very last minute, you know, like behind the scenes. And I was privy to these conversations saying like Russia will never intervene. They didn't believe he was intelligence on that, you know, until February 24th. Uh, and um, and I think, you know, like one of the generals like also had to leave where at least, you know, had, there was some kind of punishment because, um, you know, it was clearly like it was uh, unacceptable, uh, the, the attitudes that they had, or like it was such a mistake. Uh, and it was to a certain degree, it was, it was recognized. So my, my two finger on that um, question um, is um, in that, in the quality, uh, in the discussions around um, having a European nuclear deterrent that is French controlled, um, were any of the conversations um, reckoning with just how fragile the idea of extended deterrence is at all? Um, how untested and potentially flawed um, the strategic idea of there being French control over an extended deterrent of the rest of Europe? Because this is an idea that is probably some of the weakest elements of US strategy, the idea of extended deterrence. Um, yeah, absolutely. But then, you know, you always have the voices of saying like, well, but still apparently worked, right? So um, so that's why it's uh, kind of like this double-edged sword since it was never really put into practice. You can, you can buy into the illusion, but then the question is like, who do you trust better? Do you trust better the Americans in this like very fragile yeah. structure or the French? Uh, and that's of course very, very difficult. 
Uh, it's a pretty bitter pill in terms of, you know, if you were um, Lithuania or something who you'd trust more <laughs> for extended I mean, deterrence yeah, yeah. <laughs> in terms of the flawed nature of the idea at all. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I, some people might have to log off, but I have two questions to ask you and I'm going to ask yeah. both and you can kind of navigate them. So one yeah. is about the role of Turkey um, in any of these scenarios or other autonomy or yeah. neutrality. Um, yeah. How would you see them? Um, do you see them as isolated or do you see them as uh, interacting with these scenarios? And the last question is about Taiwan. Um, any, inter you know, just decisions like when Lithuania decided to support Taiwan um, and China reacted, um, can you comment on that um, strategic issue for mm -hmm. your states? Yeah. So Turkey is an incredibly complex um, issue. Uh, and again, um, nobody really knows how this will develop in the, in the future. But in the big picture of things, Europe is again divided. You have countries that um, are, and Germany, by the way, is, is one of them, uh, that believe that Turkey have a place um, in, uh, at, in NATO, uh, no longer in the EU, this debate is over. But, you know, like there's still this German community and uh, it's quite strong and it's, it's vocal. Um, and so you want to keep a, a, a good relationship no matter what. Um, and then you have other countries. Greece, of course, is number one, uh, but um, also countries where you have a kind of a, a hostility or like, a, you know, extremist party that are very anti-Muslim, that are very critical of Turkey. Uh, Overall, I think, you know, like Turkey, one needs to, so, you know, one needs to assess a little bit what's the, what's the future of Erdogan, right? And what comes after him. They are very pro-EU, pro-NATO, pro-Western forces. Uh, and then, you know, like there are the others, which have been, you know, cultivated for the last, uh, you know, since 2002, since the AK party came to power. Um, but I think it's clearly one of those questions where Europe does not speak with one voice. Uh, and the same, by the way, applies to um, uh, Taiwan. Uh, so you have, they're also a kind of split in the middle uh, where some European countries are clearly taking the position because they also like, really, like you know, an interest in these smaller countries, you know, and again, you have the Baltic states and, you know, like all those um, who are, you know, like who, and they do make the connection. And uh, so those who rely on the United States, who want to rely on the United States for their security, they are also taking a position of, of, you know, like we will support Taiwan and we're against China. Uh, so in their head, you know, like this kind of strategic trade-off that we talked about has already happened. And that's certainly in the Baltics, right? They know exactly we want to be with the United States. The cost of being in the United States is that we are on America's side when it comes to uh, China. So, you know, like we are also friends with Taiwan. Others, for example, Germany, um, the decision you know, has not been made, as we mentioned before. Uh, and so on both questions, Turkey and China, Europe is very much um, divided among itself. Um, and But sadly, um, you know, like that, that, there's not the habit as probably, you know, if there's a problem, uh, it's there's no European habit, habit of like tackling it head on. No, uh, what actually happens is just avoided. Uh, and this, these topics are not even discussed at the EU level in Brussels, uh, which of course like doesn't really um, help, the, help the issue. Well, thank you for answering those last student questions. I was a little bit indulgent and I went ahead of them. So I wanted to make sure that they got addressed. So thank you so much. And um, everyone in the audience, um, uh, I want to have you help me thank uh, Professor Henke for joining us today. And, um, and I really appreciate this conversation. It was really exploring some very um, new and frank dimensions of a topic that is discussed, but often key realities in the middle of them are not discussed. So I really appreciate your clarity today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure being with you, really.